I'm just very honored that you would all make time to do this tonight, so thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit about what you do, but Tamika, I might ask you to give a little context, because I know you've done, and you're doing, and you will do. A lot. And so I want to know, oh, it's, it's underneath your jackets. It's, you did the whole thing, and now the mic's gone. There she is. Okay, so Sam Dodge, your main responsibility is clearing up all the encampments in the city. Is that right? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can blame Great, me for awesome. that. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have a couple of different teams that work together interdepartmentally on that. And I also am working with all these ambassador programs that we have now that's kind of newly under with me. And I'm also working on these street response teams to sort of... 911 uh, response teams that are non-police that have look like super ambulances, street crisis response teams, street wellness, street overdose, and a couple of other of those kinds of teams are working to coordinate. Okay, so the street crisis response teams, HSOC stuff, so the kind of clearing up encampments or addressing encampments, or we'll talk about that, and then also all the community ambassadors. And that's the kind of the, all the urban alchemy folks in yeah, downtown, a, the people with the green vests, have people seen those folks? The four of you that have gone downtown in the last six months? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Shireen, what do you do? Director McSpadden. <laughs> so, um, hi everyone. I'm Shireen McSpadden and I run the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing for Mayor Breed. Um, I was appointed a little less than two years ago and what we do is really provide housing options for people experiencing homelessness. We have outreach, um, we have shelter, we have housing solutions like permanent housing and, and other options for people who need housing support. Um, and we also have prevention dollars to prevent people from being homeless in the first place. So that's what we do. All right, thank you very much. And this is your 19th time at Manny's, something like that? It's my third. And is that a glow necklace? Yeah. Well. I just came from a going away party for one of my staff, and I couldn't stay, but I took the glow necklace. Glow necklace. I love it. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> Tamika, can you talk to us a little bit about what you did at Hamilton and what you're doing now with... Um, oh. Uh-oh. Um, you want me to help you? No, no, no. You got it. No. Uh, Dan? All home. All home. <laughs> All home. Dan Lurie's on the chair of the board of All Home, which is the organization that you run. Proudly. Okay. I'm doing great. I know. So far, so good. Hi, everyone. How are we doing? Um, good. I like your hair. It's fabulous. Um, my name is Tamika Moss, and as Manny said, I run uh, All Home, and we are an organization that works across the nine-county Bay Area to coordinate and align our responses to the homelessness crisis, and frankly, not just our brothers and sisters who are currently on the street, but really thinking about all of those who are one economic or health emergency away from a housing crisis, which is about a million people in the nine county Bay Area. So we work both on housing solutions and economic and income solutions to really stabilize households in our region. Awesome. So the, the, this is a four part series and we're trying to, I think you heard my little intro, trying to get like a 360 understanding of the issue of homelessness. And tonight is really what is being done. Not what should be done, but what is actually happening right now to address homelessness. Um, and I think, it, I think it probably makes sense to start and just, if you can, um, try to go between super granular and super broad, like in between, about what, your, what the organization that you run, what are their operations, and how much money is being spent to do those things. So for you, Sam, I want to know what the street crisis response team is, how much money is being used to actually do that, um, and kind of go through it and tell me kind of, kind of how you are each trying to address the issue with the various organizations that you represent. Okay, I'll try my best. I work at the Department of Emergency Management, so they're probably best known for the 911 call center. Um, but, you know, maybe more recently well known for running the COVID Central Command when the city was in the throes of everything and really running the city. So as part of that, we um, have this role of coordinating. And the street crisis response team was this idea, and it's still kind of an ongoing experiment, that we could have a, a non-police response to many 911 calls. When you call 911, there's kind of branches off into two sides. There's police, 
fire, and EMS. And so these calls, a lot of them, could be gone to EMS, and we would have a special team that would be paramedics, which is sort of a super EMT. It'll be a, so paramedic, an EMT, and an outreach worker or a, a peer, um, you know, it's called a, so this RAMS group, and uh, or also a clinician. And so it's, I, the, it's really a lot from the fire department side. You see these red trucks around. Um, so I don't have their budget, but it's 12 uh, vehicles a day and they run 24 hours. And so it's, it's been very effective. One of the things that we did recently was a little change and the Chronicle kind of had a hard time understanding it, but it's okay, um, was that the, the health department thought the best use of the, the clinicians was be for aftercare and they have this, so they have a follow-up care and the paramedics can do uh, 5150 holds, which is an important thing if someone's in crisis and you need to really take them in. So just to make, to be clear, so when someone calls 911, or whatever, because there's a homeless person, instead of sending police, they send the street crisis response team, this paramedic, this fire, little fire truck goes, have people seen these? Yeah, and it's three or four people inside, you know, someone that's a peer, da, da, da. So how long has this been going on for, and how have you been able to measure success? And like, what, what do they do when they go to the person who's homeless? Like, what typically happens? So, you know, it's a call that may be like, hey, someone's in distress. Like, I don't know what's going on. But, you know, oftentimes it overlaps with homelessness. And so they have supplies in there, like, you know, a warm, warm meals, clothes, water, stuff like that. So they can, you know, de-escalate a crisis, but also they can transport. And they can transport not just to the hospital, but to uh, drop-in centers and, and other, other resources. And they're connected to the shelter system as well. So um, it's a very versatile team that can solve a lot of different sort of issues. And you said it's been going really well. How, what do, how do you measure that? Like, what, what does well look like to you? Every call is diverted away from the police. I mean, the way that the call cords were going before was like suspicious person or other kinds of things. They were going primarily to the police. And so this allows the police to maintain a lot of capacity, this high volume of calls. But it's also a more effective solution because sometimes it's a repeated visits. I mean, obviously, there's no magic here. But sometimes it takes some time working with someone. But oftentimes, they're able to... Uh, really address the situation in a holistic way and help someone out of this situation. Okay, before we move on to Tamika and then we'll go to Shireen, talk to me about um, the kind of, maybe this is, I don't know exactly what you'd call it, but the HSOC, like clearing the street um, portion of your role, or at least previously, where yeah. you were the guy, as I understand it, where if someone complained or someone was like, there's like a tent in the street, like we need, we need the street, and they called you and you tried to get a group of folks together to address that. So what was what what happens when someone's like, there's a tent on the sidewalk and it needs to be moved and they call you, what then next happens? Okay, <laughs> it's not quite so uh, antiquated, but uh, luckily not everyone has to call me or whatever. But um, the what we realized in the city previously was that every department had some sort of cleaved off uh, resource that they were using to address street crisis, you know, just tent encampments, people living unsheltered. And it, it was wasteful. Like, people didn't know our codes and, you know, abilities from different departments are all very balkanized. And so um, what we realized and what we really pushed for was that, you know, housing is a solution to homelessness, that, you know, we really need, uh, people need a place to be. We can't just sort of sweep along or move people block to block, like that's not effective, a solution. And um, and the, uh, we want to be humanitarian. Like, you know, we're all working professionals. We're not here to be mean or whatever. And so we needed to really work together. And the police, of, of, you know, were like the number one, like, yes, we want to see people helped. Like, there's we don't want to wrestle with someone because they're homeless and, you know, it's not... Uh, effective and it's not what we want to be doing with our lives and so we get all together with it's seven uh, main departments and we pull in other departments as need be there might be uh, what are the property seven? owners 
So there's the MTA, there's HSH, uh, there's, oh, okay, uh, there's, sorry, there's the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, Shireen, a uh, main partner. Um, there's the Department of Emergency Management. Uh, there's uh, the San Francisco Police Department. There's the San Francisco Fire Department. Uh, there's the Department of Public Health. Um, there's uh, Rec and Park. Rec and uh, Park. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it, the whole the whole mishpacha. Yeah. So it goes on, you know, like, and and we get together, and and people have issues that are arriving and uh, arising in their different properties or within their spheres, and you're able to uh, bring it up to each other. We have a daily. 10, 15 meeting where it's like a stand-up meeting where we're talking about what we did yesterday, what we're doing today, what we're doing tomorrow. Everyone rank and file are able to uh, raise issues and we're able to communicate and, you know, say, okay, we need, um, you know, homeless outreach over here or we need help from uh, DPH over there or we need public works to help clean here. There's some abandoned debris. The reason I'm spending so much time on this is because my guess is that most people in this room, when they think of homelessness in San Francisco, they're thinking of, I saw a homeless person sleeping on the street or there's tents everywhere. And what is the city doing to, what is the city doing for these people? Um, and so that's why I'm kind of, normally I would be moving along a lot quite faster, but I think actually your piece of it um, a lot is like the most visual and representative sample of what people think of. So just so I have this clear, 10.15 every morning, those seven departments, reps from those seven departments meet in a stand-up call, and they say things like, we're getting a lot of calls from you know, Clement Street. There's a bunch of folks out there. We need to bring in different departmental resources to address that. Is it like a fight? Like, I don't have time to go to Clement because we're getting a lot of calls in the hairball, or like the Clement, I mean the TL, like we're not doing what we need. Like, how is that negotiated in that call? Just between us. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not. I imagine you can't. There's limited resources, right? There's limited time and resources. Yeah, we can't do can't do it all. We're here to help each other, you know. And so it's it's a very uh, important job that we're able to like all support each other with what we may need, you know. Maybe uh, it's just as simple as the homeless outreach um, goes to where the police officer said, "Hey, I've been see getting a lot of calls about this place." Can Homeless Outreach go out? And they, they do go out, and they might come back and say, you know what, we're working with these guys. Give us a little bit of time. And so there's there's an ability to have that sort of conversation across departments, whereas you can imagine previously that was not happening, or it was happening on a thread of emails that gets pretty unmanageable. Um, and so it you know working together it works, and this trying to keep people's morales up too. I mean, as you can imagine, it's very daunting uh, this work gets kind of put on, you know, a rank and file public works guy on a litter patrol. Hey, solve this, or uh, you know, an officer, or just a single outreach op uh, worker. And it's sort of bigger than all of us. And so that's my main role is to kind of like keep us all together, track what's going on, make sure that we, you know, try to prioritize based on acuity, based on size based on, you know, I have one team that can be one place at a time. Um, and so that's an important thing. So we have a good big inter, uh, departmental team, but we can also work together out of sync with our existing departments. Thank you. Tamika, um, I, so right now with your work, it is, it is addressing the issue regionally. And last night we talked with someone who made the claim at the end, if we remember, it was something like we could house 8,000 people um, and put them all in housing, but it is very likely that 8,000 more folks, if we provide the housing for everyone, more folks will come. Really, like, every neighborhood, every city needs to be providing the housing for the folks that need housing in their uh, community. So talk to us about solving this um, issue regionally and what you are doing to do that, and if you're willing to express, like, how much money needs to be devoted to doing this properly, would you say? So a small question. Let me... Let me um... <laughs> Let me start by saying, I, I, I feel like uh, one of the challenges with the issue of homelessness is that we think that it's the responsibility of one jurisdiction to solve it. The city points the finger at the county, the county points the finger at the CBO. There's a lot of finger pointing in terms of who is causing the issue, who's supposed to solve it. And so one of the things that we try to do at All Home is acknowledge that every stakeholder 
in the ecosystem has a role to play in solving and addressing homelessness and housing insecurity. From the business sector to folks who are directly impacted, from our public sector partners, our private sector partners. So regionalism actually means not just coordinating across jurisdictions, cities and counties and communities, it also means that everyone that touches this issue needs to be working together in order to figure out solutions that can scale. And that's one of the hardest elements of the work because most communities are incredibly isolated. And so if you think about San Francisco as a city and county, you have Sam and Shireen talking every day, you got interagency departments working on this issue. And let's be clear, San Francisco is doing a great deal of work on addressing the crisis. The crisis is structural first of all. So at the regional level, we talk about what are the fundamental issues that cause homelessness. And a lot of folks love to debate me on it's, you know, a person's personal choice around addiction or mental health. But we know that these issues are structural. It is structural racism. It is the lack of deeply affordable housing. We have underproduced housing in San Francisco, particularly for the last 40 years. So this is a compounded problem that we now are in where people who are earning $100,000 a year can't actually afford to live in the city without a subsidy. So when you think about marginalized community like black folks in San Francisco, where the household income, um, area median income for black folks in San Francisco is $30,000 a year, and the average rent for a one bedroom apartment is $3,200 a, a month, you're gonna have a gap in terms of where people are able to access housing and the things that they need. So part of why All Home exists is to elevate these issues for every community across the region. San Francisco has been going it alone, trying to figure it out, partnering with whomever will partner with them. So has Contra Costa County. So has Alameda County. So part of our role is to help each of those jurisdictions understand what actually is going on in each community and how they are similar. There are a lot of things that are uh, common uh, in each of those communities and how can we streamline some of our practices that are data informed and evidence based. You should be able to, if you're housed in, um, in San Francisco and you lose your housing and you go to stay with your family in Alameda County, you should be able to have a se seamless connection to services and supports that you need in the county that you go to. But our region doesn't function as one place. Each jurisdiction has its own set of uh, regulatory rules and, and fun funding rules that makes collaboration and alignment really difficult. So part of why we exist is to shine a light on that and say, where are the places where we can streamline resources, strategies, and scale some of those at the regional level? How, ooh. <clears throat> I imagine that building housing or shelters for homeless people is probably not number one on the list of priorities for some of these other townships and cities, right? That's probably not a huge reach. How do, how could, how could you like, do you shame them? Do you like tell them they really, really should? Like how do you, um, how, what enforcement mechanisms or kind of tools do you have to kind of get non-San Francisco regional places to also do, like try to put in the effort that we're trying to put in? Yeah, I mean, look, I think, this notion that people come to San Francisco to be homeless, the data doesn't actually bear that out. Most people who experience a housing crisis actually experience it in the neighborhood where they come from. And that is consistent across the state of California and across the region. So when someone said 8,000 people can be housed and eight more thousand will come, the fact of the matter is when I was working in Hamilton families, for every family that we house, three more would become homeless during the same period of time. That is not a, we don't know what we're doing to house people problem. That is a poverty problem. That is a lack of affordable housing problem. That is a disproportionate impact on black and brown people problem. So part of what we need to help people understand is addressing homelessness isn't just about um, fixing the people who are experiencing the crisis. It affects us all. And the incentives we try to say to folks is, if you don't want encampments in your community, if you don't want your businesses being impacted negatively because people are, there's, there's 
you know, trash on the street or folks are causing nuisances, housing is the way to solve that problem. And you have to figure out how to embrace and be pro-housing uh, in every community across the region. And so that's how we, we try to create a scenario where people can see themselves in the solution set and then create opportunities for folks to, um, when they say fix the homelessness problem, we're like, say yes to housing, we'd love to. But you can't fight the affordable housing development that just went before your planning commission and then wonder why there are unhoused people in your doorstep. A two-parter for you, and then we'll get to you, Shireen. Are you like running candidates in local races that are pro-housing to make sure that, because ultimately the decision to build this kind of housing comes down to a small set of people who are decision makers who get to vote on these things. So is that kind of, a, is there a political strategy? Um, again, just between us. Yeah. And then the second thing is one of the things we heard last night in the history of homelessness was like really one of the main turning points in this was when Ronald Reagan kind of gutted HUD and got rid of a lot of the, um, and actually with Dr. Kuchel on Monday, that, that Section 8 housing vouchers and really like the federal government is really the only body that can with some expediency address this issue by making, by like really beefing up the subsidies that people get who cannot afford housing at the market rate. So the next question is like, are there groups and are you one of those groups that's trying to get the federal government to go back to what it was doing before Ronald Reagan? And how's that going? <laughs> it's two first. I'm giving you the I hard mean... questions because you're the boss. Like you are <laughs> the boss. Well, to your first question, I'd say our strategy is less political and more strategic. So we try to think of what are the solutions that we know work and how do we get all of those stakeholders that I mentioned earlier to buy into those solutions and figure out how to resource them and scale them. So for example, we have a regional impact council. We brought all stakeholders together across all sectors for more than a year and a half, including Mayor Breed and Shireen and many other partners to say, what do we need to be doing about the unsheltered crisis across the nine counties together in order to combat the, the, the urgency of the crisis that we see on the street. And we came up with the regional action plan, which had a really aggressive goal of reducing unsheltered homelessness by 75% over the next three years. Now that was an ambitious goal, but what it, what it said was 125 stakeholders from every county, every sector said it's not okay what is happening on our streets. And yet we can't, we don't have the infrastructure or the resources to just eliminate the crisis. So we have been really talking about a formula that we came up with Manny during this process. Margo was on, on the Regional Impact Council and many others, and we call it our 124 framework. And the 124 framework is essentially saying, what do we need to do in terms of prevention, interim housing, which can mean non-congregate shelter, tiny homes, cabin communities, NAV center, whatever you call that, and permanent housing. What is the percentage that each jurisdiction needs across the region to reduce unsheltered homelessness by 75%? So we do the data analysis for each county to come up with that percent. How many of those units need to be uh, transitional housing or interim housing, how many permanent housing units do you really need? So that jurisdictions aren't just guessing. We're not having a reactive response to the crisis. We're actually using data to inform our processes. So that's one thing that I think helps create the political will to say, ah, if we can embrace this formula and, and support it with resources, because most jurisdictions, by the way, don't have enough money to pay for it. Just in Alameda County, it would cost about $1.6 billion over five years to house 75% of the people who are unhoused in our county. And when I worked for, as, with Mayor Schaff as her chief of staff in 2015, homelessness was not the top priority in our city. So this is a new problem for the city of Oakland, and yet it's going to cost us $1.6 billion in the county to to address the crisis and the rapid nature of the crisis. So that's what we try to do is, is use data, we use resources, we incentivize jurisdictions to buy into some of these solutions. We raise money to do that and then provide those resources back to communities so that they can invest in some of the innovation that it's gonna take for them to scale some of their work. And then we try to 
figure out how to incentivize the rest of the partners to come on board. So to your second part of the question about the federal government, and then I, I really oh, am yeah, going to stop I, talking. Honestly, you I forgot was, that question? I, I was know. looking at you, yeah. and I was like, wow. No, I got you. I got but you. But then I forgot the second part. Of the, so, oh, yes. Okay. 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 Quickly. So in 2012, Governor Brown at the time actually eliminated redevelopment in the state of California. Redevelopment was the tool that most jurisdictions in the state utilized to create uh, deeply affordable housing across our state. Most jurisdictions across the country still have redevelopment. It's a tax increment financing tool that allows us to borrow money against future uh, value in a neighborhood, right? So Jerry Brown actually used redevelopment in the city of Oakland to re revitalize my old neighborhood, the Uptown. Any Oaklanders in the house, by the way? Okay, give me a little something. All right. A couple of folks, okay. But then abolished it without an alternative funding source. So... No, so now we have no mechanism to really scale investments in affordable housing at the state or local levels. So cities and counties are going it alone, trying to do bonds. We have a really exciting bond campaign I'm gonna tell y'all about in a little bit um, across the nine counties. But the fact of the matter is the federal government stopped investing in the development of housing 25 years ago. And so, this administration is the first one that actually came out, at least in two decades that I've been in this work, and said, you know what? Housing and homelessness are our top priorities. They remain the top priorities in the state of California. And so absolutely, Margo's right. We need the federal government to re-engage. And we need local and county and state partners to be doing their part as well so that when the state, when the federal government brings resources into our communities like they did during COVID, we actually have the infrastructure to deploy those resources, not just toward people who need it now, but toward outcomes. Outcomes that are actually gonna reduce the number of folks in our community who are struggling. I'm tired, child. That's why, Just that's talking why I about got, it. That's why I Where's got, my wine? Right over there. That's why I got you a glass of wine. Um, so just like I did, that's why you need the, the red wine is, is crucial. So um, just like I did with Sam, I'm going to try to repeat what the, what the plan is. So I am a member of the city council of the great city of Hercules. Oh. I'm not actually, but let's oh. say I am. <laughs> And I, and Tamika Moss comes up and is like, I'd like to have lunch with you. And I go, okay. And, she, and, and then you tell me this is, this is one, two, four strategy. So the way for Hercules to get to, a, to house 75% of the 100 people who are currently sleeping um, outside in Hercules is that you need to build one shelter bed for every two units of permanent supportive housing for four sets of credits, rental credits, for folks who are about to lose their apartment because, or the house because they can't afford rent. Is that right? That's the one, two, four? Sort of. So for, and this one, two, four was set across the nine counties. Each county, we do a one, two, four analysis. So for Oakland, it's one, four, four, right? So it, it, that formula can change based on the population and what the needs are. But for Hercules, what I would say to the city council member Thank at you. lunch, yes. uh huh, Manny, is what we need to um, end your housing, your homelessness problem, is to build one building of deeply affordable housing of 100 units or more, and then all your people have a place to live. So you don't have to go through the formula if your problem is small. Napa County has 125 unhoused people. We're working with Napa to figure out, A, how to prevent more people from falling into homelessness, but also how to build buildings, get them a, a permitted so that they don't have to go, they don't have to wait. Folks don't have to wait for the problem to get so massive that you can't afford to actually solve the problem. All right, thank you very much, Tamika. Yeah. Director McSpadden, so you run the Department of Homelessness Services and you've done it for a few years now. Um, um, how long? Almost. Oh, oh. Um, and uh, so what does the Department of Homelessness Services doing in the city right now to address homelessness? What is your budget? Um, and where is the budget going? So, okay, so our budget is about $680 million annually, or at least this year, six seventy, six eighty, and the bulk of our budget really goes to housing people. So right now, at any given time, we are housing approximately 15,000 people. 
and that's between um, that's a mix of shelter and permanent supportive housing. So I think a lot of people look at our budget and go, oh, "Wow, that's so much money!" And they're like, you know, forty five hundred people on the street, and they do the math and they leave out the fact that we actually have an active, ongoing housing and shelter program for a number of people. Last year alone, last fiscal year, we um, sheltered over 7,500 people, I believe. And so even though we go, you know, I do this too, you got on the street and you see encampments and you see tents and you see people living unsheltered, the city is doing an incredible amount to actually make sure that people are housed, that, that we have shelter. I mean, you know, unfortunately we don't have enough. We need, we continue to, to try to figure out how to create more, um, you know, more permanent supportive housing for sure. We also think a lot about how to keep people from being homeless in the first place. So we have active subsidy programs, um, not just in our department, but across the city. Um, they kind of sit in various places across the city. But the, you know, we really are invested in housing and taking every opportunity that we can, not only to use the local funds that we have, um, including Prop C, but also to, to really be aggressive with um, going after state and federal funds when they're available. Does everyone know about the Prop C thing? Does anyone not know about the Prop C thing? That's okay if you don't. Okay, can you explain the Prop C thing for folks who don't know what that is? Because it has been mentioned a few times over the last few days and it's yeah, so it's a big kahuna as they Prop say. Prop C was, was um, actually passed by the voters in 2000. It was pre-pandemic. 2018, it's pre-me being part of Honestly, this department. Honestly, before February um, 2020, I don't even know what happened. <laughs> I, I don't know, remember right? anything. I went to a party once, that's it. And it basically creates a, a business tax that that um, gives money to support people experiencing homelessness to really be active in um, finding new ways to, to permanent solutions for homelessness. And there's an active committee that really that really um, looks at the funds each year and kind of comes up with an allocation process. And it's like five hundred million dollars, right? It's well, it was three hundred million, but you know, it also has some softness in it because we we are seeing some businesses not be as present in San Francisco as they were. So there is a weakness in it, but it's still an incredible resource compared to what a lot of jurisdictions have. I mean. Tamika, I think, already said this, but a lot of jurisdictions don't have the money that San Francisco has, and San Francisco has a history of really putting a lot of resources into issues um, like homelessness. So we're really we're fortunate to have it. Um, I think, you know, we learned a lot during COVID, and one of the things that what happened for us in when we did our what we call the point in time count which is required by the federal government um, every two years of every jurisdiction, every um, continuum of care, we actually saw a decrease in, uh, in overall homelessness. We saw a 15% decrease in unsheltered homelessness. And that's because we were so aggressive at partnering with the hotel industry to, to create homes for people who are on the street and people who are in congregate shelters. I mean, if you think back, um, to that time, we were really, really concerned about people congregating, and so we realized our congregate shelter model didn't work. And we were also concerned about people on the street um, having to move around a lot and go to long lines for meals and things. And so we were really successful in that program. Since then, um, with a program with local resources and a program called HomeKey, we've been able to acquire a number of new buildings. So we actually have online now more permanent supportive housing than we've ever had in our system in, in the city. Okay, so a couple quick follow-ups. One, of the 650 or so million dollars of budget, like what percentage of that is going to house these 15,000 15, people? Meaning like what percentage do you have to allocate to new programs or new, uh, new ideas? So people have a frame of reference. Well, right now we, you know, we our budget is kind of flat as we go into this next year because of just because of the economy. I mean, we're using our dollars in we're using all of our dollars, right? Meaning flat, meaning like you don't actually have more money to spend. We don't necessarily have more money to spend going into the next year, but we also know that homelessness is such a priority for the city 
that um, we probably, you know, we probably will have more dollars to put into things like shelter. I mean, we are expending the dollars we have for outreach, for prevention, for shelter. But like building, I think one of the things I'm trying to clarify is last yeah. night the person on the stage said there's no new money to, to buy one more unit of permanent supportive housing or build another shelter bed. And I guess what I'm wondering is like, is that actually the case right now? Like, is there no extra dollars to build more housing or shelter more people in the current budget? That's essentially true. I mean, we do have some dollars still for transitional age youth. Um, that we are deploying. We also have a number of units available. So while it's true that we're not bringing more units online, we actually have units that are not leased up yet. We have some brand new buildings that were just opening in March and April. And so we're still going to be able to have see a flow. I guess I just want to, I'm going to try to channel, when I, when I ask these questions, I'm trying to channel like not me, but like the like, layperson's observer. I'm also the layperson's observer. But like, I'm trying to like, if someone were to hear what you just said, like, what would their next question be? I think the next question that that person would ask is, wait a second. So San Francisco has a, San Francisco's Department of Homelessness has a $700 million budget, but no money to do more to address the 4,000 or so folks who are, who are counted as homelessness in our street, to, to bring more people into shelter. And so my reflection on you, for you is like, how, what do you think about that? Like, do you feel like all the things that have been done to get us to this point were the right things? Because what we now have, is, if we're going to keep these 15,000 people housed, is we're going to need $700 million a year, it sounds like, to keep them in their units before we even try to talk about the other folks that we need to bring in. So I wonder kind of like, oh my God, was this the right thing to do? It sounds like it, sounds like it was, but like, how do you address the issue if it's costing so much just to keep it where we are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so, I, I, I mean, one of the things we know is it's cheaper to keep people housed in the first place. And so our prevention dollars and, and that whole unit has really, we've really built that out. Um, it is way cheaper. It's also cheaper to help somebody problem solve their issue, their housing issue, because sometimes it's not actually that much. And when we we look at the data around problem solving, um, which again is a fairly new piece of what we're doing, we realize that sometimes we can spend you know three to ten thousand dollars to help somebody as opposed to what it costs to house them every month into perpetuity. I think we also need to build in new supports within our system. So. You know, we need to create and, and continue to create a flow in our system. Not everybody needs to be um, in the homeless response system for the rest of their lives. So how do we do that? Because um, someone was asking me this last night. Like, how do you get someone who's living in permanent supportive housing to do get what, get what they need to get or do what they need to do to be able to not have to rely on permanent supportive housing? Someone asked about yeah. workforce training last night in the back corner. And what the guest last night said is like a lot of the folks who are coming into the system now are a lot older. And so it's not, it's a lot harder to get someone, I think they, he said it was the average age was 59, which yeah. is very different. It's probably a very different mechanism to try to get that person to support themselves economically enough to not need permanent supportive housing. So talk to me a little bit about that challenge. Sure. I mean, I, and I, so yes. And, all, and actually all three of you, I mean, because you all three work in this, so it doesn't have yeah. to just be on you, Shereen. Director McSpadden. Well, so we we do know that um, older adults are the fastest growing segment of the adult population of people experiencing homelessness. That's of particular concern, but it's not surprising given that how expensive it is to live here. And there are, you know, there are a variety of models actually out there that we're working on with, you know, using Medi-Cal dollars and things like that to really help support people. And that's something that San Francisco is really invested in, and that is one way that we're going to see new dollars. And I'm really excited about a lot of that. And I think part of it is when we think about permanent supportive housing and we think of populations that have high acuity, which tends to happen as people age and, and, be, and become disabled in some ways, um, we need to figure out what those supports really are, and we can use those dollars to help do that. And there are a lot of other resources around that. But I think in addition, um, you know, we have some small programs for people who want to exit permanent supportive housing in San Francisco. We call ours the housing ladder. We haven't really focused on 
you know, large numbers of people moving into the housing ladder and then into permanent housing. There are other jurisdictions who've, who've really, really, um, really used well a program called rapid rehousing. There are a number of our colleagues across the, the country who do that where people need short-term support and then you know they're able to move on out. And a lot of the key to a lot of people, to people moving through is really making sure that they have either case management or something along those lines that helps them create a plan and then move on. Got it. Um, did you have something you wanted to add to that? I, mean, I saw yeah. the mic get closer and I wanted to. Yeah, no, I just wanted to lift up the moving on initiative that Tipping Point supported and the society was running which was providing vouchers for people who were wanting to move out of permanent supportive housing and transition into the private market. But with vouchers not being readily accessible from the federal government, folks are not willing to take the risk, especially in a city uh, like San Francisco where the housing costs are so exorbitant. Um, they they don't want to lose the security of having a permanent place to live. So again, some of these strategies, yeah. part of our, our challenge is that our system is not creating flow fast enough that people have to get so sick and, and destitute, frankly, in order to access services that if we did prevention at scale, you have a housing emergency, you call 211, you get the hundred thousand or the thousand dollars you need to pay the back rent and to whatever you don't have to get into the homelessness response system at all so i think trying to think about like how do we make all parts of the system around the homelessness system work better could divert many people from a housing crisis that could be short term that turns into long term because we don't have adequate triage for meeting people where they are and customizing those interventions, frankly, at a much more cost-effective scale than it would to permanently house them once they become permanently disabled. And there are some really good models for workforce development out there. And I mean, the nonprofit system in San Francisco doesn't have enough workers. We don't have enough workers in the city right now. And so we really wanna see those programs scale up and because people, who've experienced homelessness are sometimes the best people to work in the homelessness response system. Got it. I'd like to get to audience questions in about one or two minutes. And so very quickly, um, this is going to sound like a gotcha question, but it's not. Um, it, it is something that I think I've had people ask me, which was like, when was the last time San Francisco built a homeless shelter? When was the last time San Francisco built a homeless shelter? Well, so I mean, congregate, not congregate. I mean, everyone on the stage has said, and because it is yeah. true when you work in this issue, that housing is a solution to homelessness. And I think everyone would agree that, that that is the best solution to homelessness. But I think a lot of people also ask the question, like, don't you also need shelters for people who, like, there isn't a, a permanent unit for them, but it's probably better than sleeping out in the cold. So, like, shouldn't we have at least more shelter beds for the emergency moments? So just, so we have several examples of that. I mean, I, so I guess one of the newest ones we have is one in Lower Knob Hill that houses 250 people. We just opened that within the last 12 months. Um, we have the cabins at 33 Goff, which house I think 70 people. Um, that has been within the last year, year and a half. So we are bringing shelter online. We also, you know, we're really thinking about different models of shelter. So when you, when you, when people think of shelter, I think they often think of these big mass congregate sites. We're really not moving in that direction um, anymore. We're really thinking about more temporary um, non-congregate sites, but we've got a couple more in the works. So we are thinking about that all the time and we're bringing shelter on all the time in addition to the housing that we brought on over the past few years. I don't want to monopolize the mic, so Sam, if you want to get in here. I just want to quickly say, we cannot build our way out of this problem when it takes three to five years to build one unit of housing, and it costs an average of a million dollars per door to build it. So let's be clear that we have a broken housing system that needs repair so that the homelessness response system can act more efficiently in the delivery of its services. And so I just want to reiterate before we open up to the audience that 
all of these factors are contributing to why it's so expensive and why it takes so damn long for people to be brought inside. Okay, well, um, just a quick um, response question to that. I heard, spicy question, I heard that part of the reason why it's so expensive is because the unions don't want to allow the city to, to bring in modular housing that was built overseas because it, it is non-union labor, Union, it, you lose union jobs. If you're going to build 10,000 units of housing and you use modular housing, that's going to be... <laughs> what? Oh, no. Oh, drinking wine. But, like, we got to talk about it. So, like, if we didn't have to use union labor and we could use modular housing built overseas that could just be placed in place, why... Vallejo. Vallejo. Well, that, to me, that's practically overseas. <laughs> You know, would it, it seems like I heard it's be, it would be a lot cheaper and would that, would that assist in the three to five year timeline in the $1 million per unit? Yes. L labor's not our only um, segment of the population who's resisting different building typologies to solve the crisis. So let's be clear. But are they resisting it? Um, I think that there are uh, labor organizations that want labor standards that allow their workers to be a part of the production of modular housing. And But do you think that labor, do you think that we should make an exception for modular housing, that it doesn't necessarily have to be labor union built just to get done quickly? I mean, I think personally we should have over-the-counter permitting for any 100% affordable development in any part of the state. I mean, we should be waiving zoning and CEQA to, to expedite the crisis. I mean, let's be clear, there are solutions abound, but the constraints of how we operate this housing market is comes from all sides. It's actually working for some people. It just ain't working for our people. Just saying. Um, okay, let's go to audience questions. Uh, Precious has the mic, raise your hand. I know I took a little bit longer than I did the last two days, but we have three amazing panelists and I wanted to get them in. Let's go to the person in the back with their hand raised and the, and Precious is gonna hold the mic to your mouth, so just speak into the mic. So um, I, I came in a little late for parking, but um, I'm a retired public health nurse that worked in with homeless in Tom Waddell in, in um, supportive housing at the Empress in the Plaza. And um, I can't even get a permit from city planning to build a deck, so. Yeah, 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 it's ridiculous. But we, there's a long list of ridiculous. Um, but in, ter in terms of um, the homeless, um, I, I, in it, I, I might have missed it, because I haven't been to all of these meetings. Um, I would love to see um, it addressed in, la I call them layers. I worked with the, the worst layer of people. Worst is a bad word, but the most um, needy and ill, challenged group of people who I loved but could not really make progress even though they had housing. Most of them could not make progress. And I don't know if we're looking at the layers. Like the housing you're talking about is really good for, you know, I, I think I divided into five or six layers. I don't have my layers with me. But um, uh, my layer really are long-term, severe drug addicted, mentally ill, usually both, um, people, yeah, some young, that really need to be in, uh, and everybody's gonna boo me, locked rehabilitation and conserved in a nice rehab that I would make beautiful and have lots of great stuff in it to help them because they can't, they can't get it. Our nonprofits can't give it to them. They won't access them. They often say no to housing. And they're, they're, you know, like we, we just need to, to do something really, really intense. And the older people that I worked with, I, I would have loved to have put them someplace for whatever period of time, conserve them, and let them do their art and their music and their, you know, have all the wonderful things they'd love to do. Not, not to interrupt you, but, is, but I just and did. Is your question like, how can we, where can we find the housing for the folks that need to be conserved? It's it's not just housing. It's or the place to it's triage. Treat, it's treatment. Okay, let's get to that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's let. Got it. Got it. And no one's going to boo you here. We don't do that at Manny's, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Sh Shireen and Sam. Okay. I'm. Shireen's very good at this too, but I, I will say that one of the great things that I have to do is to work across departments and some things 
are more acute than can be handled at like a nonprofit run facility that's really, you know, mainly about little supports. And we work with the Department of Public Health. They have a behavioral health side and the people may remember Mental Health SF was a big initiative and there's been a lot of investments in that, greatly expanding the locked beds and stuff because there is obviously an acute need for that. And we have clinicians that go out with us when we're evaluating sites and we're getting calls for help, you know, and they do end up working on the, on the hardest to serve sort of people struggling in our, you know, our city and some are right here in the mission and I think there, I heard there's a lot of people in the mission that are here, right? And one of the mechanisms of our city is this is the general hospital here. So there's a, a mechanism for sort of bringing people from around the city and bringing them right to the mission and there's also sort of limits that they have for holding on to people, a very liberal state and for a good reason about this, about you know denying people their freedom, but it often means that we have people that are really in crisis in the mission, just kind of wandering about. And sometimes it can become, it's a very long and diligent process, but these clinicians that work, we all work together and we have a, uh, you know, an interdepartmental kind of um, where we can really talk, uh, share all the information that clinicians can share. And it ends up a lot of the time, um, you know, uh, institutionalizing people. And so we have that mechanism now. I think it's better than before because of these investments in mental health SF. But sometimes when we talk about homelessness, we're talking about what Tamika's talking about, the systemic structural issues. But I think for a lot of people, it's that visceral experience where it's like, this person has no clothes on, like this person's, you know, open wounds and is totally unable to care for themselves. Like, how are we doing this? I'm sure you all see, have experienced this. Well, it's very difficult, but we do respond to that. And so making those calls, making those referrals, they do end up someplace. And sometimes it takes so long that you kind of forget that, oh, that guy who used to be in front of the Social Security office in Val uh, Valencia in 22nd, like, he's not there anymore. I wonder what happened to him. Yeah. Shereen, uh, you want to answer this, and I'd love for you to do that. And just remember, the, the purpose of tonight is what is currently being done. So in, in your answers and in your questions, please refer to your questions like, what are we doing to address this? So what, what are we doing to address that population? Sure, and I think, I, I think it's really true, and I said this earlier, that we need different levels of support for people experiencing homelessness. Sometimes people have a higher level of acuity, especially when they come in. And so when you say we have a what does that mean? So a higher level of illness. Sometimes people have a higher level of behavioral health issues. Um, sometimes it's around the aging process, you know, um, or just the hardness of the toughness of being on the street for so long, you know, causes a lot of people to have really serious health issues. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about that we're doing uh, most recently is we just, I think just very recently opened a new housing development on Mission Street, which is for specifically, there's two buildings, and one building is for people with severe behavioral health issues, and one is for older adults. And it has so many supports in it, because you know what we know is that people need to have specialists, right? They need healthcare workers, they need in-home supportive services workers, they sometimes need a nurse. Um, they need behavioral health services, and so that building has, um, it's a federally um, qualified health center, it has a clinic, it has a number of supports for people. In addition to that, um, and it's a real partnership between a number of providers, and it has a workforce development um, program on site. Those are the kinds of things we really need to do to make sure that people who have the highest need get the services they need. And we do have to be better about thinking about what buildings people go into and making sure that we're providing the right support. Some people don't need that. Some people need a lot of that. And so, you know, th I think the other thing about San Francisco that as somebody who's worked for the city for 20 years, I can say is frustrating is we often work in our own silos. And I think this is a very good example of a partnership that has worked really well and we need to do more of that. And I just wanted to uh, lift up uh, CareCourt, which is a um, 
piece of legislation that the governor championed, all home was supportive of it, which, and it was quite controversial because it was really uh, partnering with uh, the state level human services departments, the judicial council, um, housing departments at the county levels to really think about housing alternatives for folks who have that level of acuity. And it passed um, and now San Francisco is actually a pilot county at the state to work with the state partners. There is a fund for bridge housing. It's $1.6 billion across the state that is accessible to jurisdictions. It's competitive funding, but it's accessible to jurisdictions to bring on more of the housing types that Shireen was just describing. So it is important that we have tools to meet people where they are, but to be clear, that is only about 10% of those who are experiencing homelessness uh, generally. So we, it is most acute and visceral, as Sam said, but it also, more than 60% of people experiencing homelessness in our region are experiencing it because of an economic crisis. So I think it's easy to conflate those things, uh, which is why we need a full continuum of interventions where people are. And again, remember, you're, at a, you're out, you've left the room, and you're in a conversation, and someone says, there's, a, there's someone on the street losing their mind. What's being done to address them? Remember, there are three answers here. Sam talked about how people do go to general hospital. There are locked beds. There are clinicians that help with them. Shireen talked about how the city did just open up a new behavioral health clinic on Mission Street for folks that are suffering from severe mental illness. And Tamika talked about the new care courts that just passed statewide. So you can answer that question. Let's go next. Um, okay, right here in front. I was going to ask about Care Corp, but I'll pivot. Um, how, is San Francisco, oops, how is San Francisco leveraging Cal AIM to improve and expand everything from street outreach to supportive housing, and, and, and what are others in the region doing? Okay, for the sake of time, let's get a couple questions in. Go ahead. Uh, you spoke a lot about kind of the strenuous permitting process in housing. Uh, just wondering what is being done about that to streamline that to make it easier for affordable housing and all housing to go live. Okay, Cal AIM, streamlining housing. One more over there. So, And all three of you can't answer each of these questions. You have to choose one. So think about it. One person's going to answer about Cal AIM. One's going to answer about streamlining housing. Maybe just, yeah, you could stand up and, okay, you got it. Um, so in addition to funds for new new units and, and more shelter beds. I'm just wondering, are there, are there plans, are there funds, I don't know if you can answer or not, to, um, to address the abysmal conditions in the existing SROs and uh, places that are existing that are, frankly, where you know, we hear all this talk about people, um, and this is speaking as someone who works on the front lines in direct service every day, um, you know, people are, are, are housed and they choose to, to still be out in a tent and they're still, I wouldn't want to stay in, uh, you know, 85% of the, of the places and rooms that, that I have seen our clients have to, have to live. Before we move on, perhaps if you're comfortable, maybe can you take one minute, if you can, just describe why that would be. What is the state of the SROs in the city right now? What are you, what are you seeing in SROs? Because, I mean, how many people here have been to an SRO inside someone's unit? I've never been in an SRO in someone's unit. So I think it might be good to maybe, without, you know, I don't want to make it like a whole thing, but like, what, why? What's it like in the SROs right now in the city? Um, everything from rodents, uh, bugs, um, uh, leaking uh, plumbing, uh, elevators that don't work for people who use walkers. Um, just horrible smells. Um, if you don't mind, just, and I'll take really quickly on that note, I'm just, and my other question, if it's okay to ask the audience, because I'm really curious, how many people here work on the front lines in direct service in homeless services? Not most, not most. Thank you. Okay. All right, so those are the three questions. Cal Ames, what are we doing to clear up that, make it easier to build this kind of housing? And you know, what do we do to make this, the, 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 how do we address the kind of situation in the SROs? I think Shireen, you're probably best for the SRO question. No? I think Sam can answer You can answer Cal Ames, and then you can talk about housing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
Why don't we start with Calame? I have no idea what that is, and so um, and that seems like maybe the easiest one to answer. So what are we doing to address Calame? I, I actually have to answer that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just messing with Sam. Um, and I'm not going to probably answer it to the extent that you want me to, but basically Calame is um, you know, an attempt to bring all the pieces of Medi-Cal um, into, into an easier to use format so that counties can address problems um, in a better way and so that Medi-Cal recipients can, can get better services. And the way we think about it in, in homelessness is really things like enhanced care management. Um, there's a carve out written in for um, skilled nursing. There, there are things like that that we're thinking about. We actually aren't at the point where we're actually implementing in our department yet but we are about to, and one of the things that we, that's gonna be a big lift for us is that a number of our nonprofit providers, um, the services can be billed to CalAIM, but you have to set up a whole infrastructure in order to do that. And so what we're doing right now is setting up that infrastructure and really looking at ways that we can use those dollars to help enhance um, the services that we have, sometimes for things that we're already doing and paying for locally, and sometimes for things to better support people, you know, going through the homelessness response system. All right. Tamika? Is that, I can talk to you more That's after. Great. Yeah, okay. and we'll, they'll have a little bit of time for one-on-ones after. Tamika, what is being done to shorten that pipeline? To streamline the permitting process for housing. Um, so one of the things that we're advocating for is, uh, Shireen mentioned earlier that uh, Project Home Key was the uh, mechanism that this, the state used federal dollars to set up a capital uh, program to build and rehabilitate. First, it started out with hotels and motels that were offline during the pandemic. That was room key, right? So we rented all of those units, used the federal uh, reimbursement dollars to actually house folks. And it was incredibly successful. It brought 15,000 people off the street in nine months. That program then transitioned into purchasing and acquiring um, buildings, existing rehabs, what have you, for permanent housing, recognizing that you need all of those interventions to support people. The streamlining of Home Key is what we're trying to get scaled. They made a deal with labor. So at a certain number of units, labor um, gets in the deal under certain units. The housing just goes forward. They waive CEQA requirements, which is the California um, Environmental Quality Act. Mm -hmm, yeah. That is a lovely um, piece of legislation that protects environmental impacts, but can be misused um, and stops a lot of housing development in communities across the state. Those things were streamlined. So there are a lot of efforts to streamline some of these processes statewide. It really is then about the implementation at the local level that really allows jurisdictions to just go forward. And I know Mayor Breed has done a ton of work to try to figure out how to bring all of those departments together, work it out. I don't want to hear it like, let's go. Um, Senate Bill S uh, 35, which is Scott Wiener's uh, legislation that also streamlined the production of affordable housing, that bill is now getting an update. And so we're gonna work with his office to really make sure that all of the advantages of affordable housing developers who take advantage of SB 35, there can be more of that and it's just easier. Um, and so those are some of the things that are going on. Okay, and very quickly, the, uh, the state of the SROs, what is being done to address them? Okay, so I worked for a long time in the SROs and we leased a lot of SROs in the city because we thought, hey, if we get a 20 year lease on this place and create a lot of permanent housing, 20 years, we'll, we'll get the HUD going. We'll, we'll get something going on the federal level, as we all know, and, and we'll get back in this thing. We won't need beautiful SROs as a mural to leaders in the SRO preservation tennis right movement. But the, um, those 20 years are up. We're really renewing those leases. We haven't been successful as a movement and as a society. And these buildings are old. They're over 100 years old. And they were built to be like 60% capacity with you know, people moving in and out. Some people live in there for a long time. Some seasonal workers or traveling business people. But we're able to convert it to be you know, permanent supportive housing with services on site and a desk clerk and, and all this stuff. But we're, it's at top capacity. 
over a hundred year old building with the electrical needs of 2023, it's like a lot of stress on these buildings. And the clients are also stressed out as we've been talking about, like they had a hard, hard road to get in there. And so they're bringing a lot of trauma to the building. And then it's like 200 people in this old building and it busts at the seams. And um, so, you know, one of the things that Shereen led on recently is to take an old building that was called the Baldwin House Hotel, sort of grandfathered in very small units where you could touch both walls of, a, of your private unit with your hand standing in the middle of it and say, you know what, that's, we can do better. We took the federal voucher, she took the federal vouchers from there to a building with private bathrooms, much nicer, a little bit up on lower Knob Hill. And then the Baldwin House itself, over 200 units, is congregate, non, you know, it's, it's non-congregate shelters, private room shelter. And that's really a, a much better use. And the turnover is faster, we're able to do the repairs better, and it's, it works really well. It's very attractive for people on the street. So that's one of the things. There also is funds now set aside that, you know, it is kind of hard to move money as fast as the need is, but they are getting it out there. And one of the things we talked earlier is about uh, redevelopment and the takeaway of redevelopment. Redevelopment locally here used to have a fund for upgrading and rehabbing SROs, redoing the elevators, redoing all this stuff. And so we still need those sort of uh, funds to sort of upgrade our permanent supportive housing. Okay, let's, um, let's, if you don't mind, let's try to get one last very quick round of questions and very quick answers before I let you all go. So very quickly, Precious, let's move around. Anyone over here? While tonight? you're doing that, Manny, yes. I just want to say there's also a really big difference between privately owned SROs and those that are regulated by nonprofit organizations. I worked for TNDC for five years in the TL at the West Hotel, at CCR, all over. And the standards in those buildings were completely different than some of the privately owned hotels that don't have the same regulatory requirements of habitability that, that TNDC and other community development organizations have. So I think standardizing some of those and holding folks accountable for the housing standards and quality is really important. Got it. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so my question, uh, so I work in film and I'm, I'm, pro I'm producing a documentary that's about the, the houseless in uh, the East Bay. Um, so it's mostly about people that li are living in RVs, mobile homes. So I'm wondering if the panel can speak to kind of like the issue of people living in mobile homes and like how that falls in your purview in San Francisco and beyond. Okay. Sure, and we, do you want me to answer now? Um, okay. Keep going, person next to you. I, I was interested in what Ms. Moss said and the, the structure, the demonization in our society and of people who are unhoused is so clear. You know, not in my backyard, government, government's the entity, work makes you strong, handouts, all that. That's very powerful. I want to know, and you said it, when we leave here and we're dealing with people, what is the framing? I mean, what do we say to people? Because it's not enough to say, hey, man, we'll get them off the streets, or this makes you a good person. That's not compelling to people. What, how do you talk to people who are sitting there saying, it's not my problem, they're from, not from here, and if we help them, more people are coming in? Got it. And then let's get, I think the last one's Jim. So quickly to Jim, and Jim, a very quick question. OK, the final one. Your, um, your, your pre predecessor came here and said, went on about how the databases didn't meet and this and that, and basically said, no, we haven't done it yet. Have you done it? And then I'd like somebody to talk about the Boise case and the uh, Coalition for Homeless lawsuit and, that, and what effect that has on trying to clean up messes on the street. Okay, I know. We've asked a lot of you all tonight, but let's go to all three questions. Which one would you like to take? Any of them? Yes. What was the first question? I actually. Oh, uh, RVs. RVs. Yes. And then there was, how, there was how, how do we talk to people who are like not in my backyard? And yeah. then the Boise case and the database. Yeah. They're not in my backyard? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, can I just say, we can't talk about the Boise case. We can't. I know. I know, but we, we can't talk about it tonight. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so. Jim, 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 let, let her answer the question. Jim, I'll talk to you offline. Okay, but um, 
So I'll just start with the RVs and say that that we actually talk a lot about what the strategy is for people living in RVs. We have RV communities in San Francisco um, where people really support each other and, um, you know, what they essentially really want is for the city to help support them via community. So we have one RV community out in Bayview um, at Candlestick Point State Park. We have another one on the port of San Francisco that we stood up during COVID really to support people who were unhoused and we are still continuing to operate that one. And then we're working closely with residents over near Lake Merced um, because there's an RV community there and we're really trying to work with them to make sure that they have the resources that they need. There are a number of people in those RVs who are, th that are families and are working families. Um, and you know, to the extent that we can, we try to get out and offer them vouchers and things like that so that they can move into a home. Um, and you know, we're also working with them and working uh, regionally to, to um, make available RV sites if they choose to, to remain in their RV outside of the, the places that we currently have in the city for them to be. Okay, and Sam, I actually, the first time I met you was when you were working for Bevan Dufty in the HOPE office, which Mayor Lee had created to address homelessness, and you were like in the front desk. I don't know what you were doing. You were there, and one of the things, so that was a long time ago, and then Jeff Kaczynski wanted to do this uh, coordinated uh, entry system, this database, and so yeah, the question is kind of, is there a coordinated entry system database where we know everyone that's homeless in the city and what's being done to help them? Yeah, I mean, the databases, and I, I'm kind of grown to be a little bit more skeptical about like, kind of, oh, we're one app or database away from perfection or total understanding or whatever, but we do have something uh, that's a, it's a great um, database with the homeless system, now that's a unified database, it's called the One System, and it's a bit focus uh, product. And and it you know it's a long process to bring all these nonprofit. We had a very balkanized you know diverse system. We created the department. We brought bringing in you know from five different departments programs that are largely contracted out to nonprofits. So you know all the housing, all the shelter, all the outreach, all into to that one thing. But that's not obviously all, right? So within the city, that database links to the health department's database, which has, uh, you know, Epic. It's an amazing system, but it really takes in a lot of information from all over the place, from jails, healthcare, um, you know, EMTs, medics, and others. So so they, we all feed up into a medical uh, side, but that's very um, protected and, um, you know, sequenced away. So. You know, it can accept everything, but not everyone can see into it. Got it. And so, so just we, just oh. one thing on that, Jim, is we have we we have a lot more information in the one system than we did um, previously. We're continuing to add modules onto it, and we have a number of dashboards on our website that really are help help to explain and make transparent the work that we're doing. So, take a look. All right, Tamika. The yeah. final question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's such an important question. And just to say, coordinated entry is actually a requirement by the federal government. So every jurisdiction across the United States has to have a coordinated data system that's trying to track what's happening to people experiencing homelessness. So everyone is still, and this only happened six years ago, so we're still working on it. But to your, to your question, sir, about um, changing hearts and minds, in my opinion, the way that we, and I, I feel, feel like I have this conversation about 5,000 times a day. Um, and so the way I try to invite people into the conversation is that we zoom out and talk much more about the affordability crisis of our, of our region, where a gallon of milk costs you $8. The, the butter I bought the other day at my market costs $9. Inflation, I know, it's Piedmont grocery, but anyway. Um, <laughs> The point is, is that our economy is producing in such an in unequal system across this region, across the state, across the country, that you can't have a system where three people become homeless in the same period of time as you house one person. The, the city and county of Los Angeles, do you all know how many people they house a month? 10,000. You hear me? 
so we don't, it's not like we don't know what to do. This isn't rocket science. It's not like we're like, damn, how are we going to help these people? It's that for 10,000 people a month get housed and double that become homeless. So we have to be able to have honest conversations about what are the systemic contributing factors to poverty and housing insecurity in our communities and be honest about those. Our educational outcomes for black and brown people are terrible. Guess what? They've been terrible for decades. Job growth, stagnant for low income workers in our region. Deeply affordable housing. I know a lot of people who can afford $900 a month. They can't afford $3,200 a month. And we don't have that housing type for somebody who's just a little bit uh, poor. Uh, maybe they got an issue or two. And if you gave them a, uh, if there was housing in the private market that they could actually afford, they would live there. 80% of people with extremely low incomes in our region, that's people earning less than $35,000 a year, rent in the private market. They do not receive a subsidy. So when you think about subsidized housing and who homelessness and who all these things are for, we have to challenge some of those mental models about who's actually accessing the resources and services within our communities and make more equitable choices and investments of how we want our entire community to thrive. That's how you fix this problem. A round of applause for Tamika Moss, Director Shreen McSpadden, and Sam Dodge.